Mr. Beatty. Yeah. This is uh, Ken. Hi, Ken. How are you? Good. Good. Um, am I pronouncing your name right? Is it is it Beatty or yep. Beatty? Beatty. What is it? Uh, okay. Just uh, so I can type it out in transcript to put it up there, rather than take notes every time you say something. Well, I hope I have something worth worth, <laughs> worth saying. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty much going to ask you about the Maria and Matthew Looney series. Um, I talked to uh, some fans of it on the internet, and uh, they've given me some questions too. So, yeah. things they liked. Uh, maybe the first question I could start off with is uh, how do you come to write the uh, first book in the Matthew Looney series? I mean, what got you started thinking about? A civilization on the moon <laughs> uh, in Matthew Looney's Voyage to the Earth. Do you recall? Well, I was looking around for an idea for a children's book. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was very little... Uh, people didn't really predict that we would ever land on the moon, and I thought I could write something about space. It would be truly science fiction. Of course, in the meantime, I was undercut by actual events. Uh -huh. But that, that, that was the origin of my idea for Matthew Looney, and I think the twisting the whole idea. Well, the first book was Matthew Looney's Voyage to the Earth, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which was a kind of an unusual twist I thought I suppose I thought it was a good idea for a children's book sure well it's interesting how all the books have a parallel to the space program as to what's going on with the space program at the time that's, that's kind of neat uh, I had a uh, Raven uh, is a woman who writes book reviews at Raven Reviews which is a website uh, she had a question for you well her question was kind of the same thing I asked how, how you came to get interested in writing something as different as the Looney series from your other work. Um, but she wanted me to thank you for, as she says here, writing girls with as much interest as boys in a genre that didn't tend towards uh, gender equality at the time. Is she referring to yeah. Matthew Looney and Maria Looney? Yeah, the Maria Looney I think she's referring to in specific. I, I think that was the first book she had read. It was the first book, actually, even I read, so, I mean, it was interesting for me as a young boy, <laughs> reading Maria Looney on the Red Planet. Well, I think uh, making a female heroine was a good idea. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I have four daughters. I don't have any sons, so maybe I was thinking sort of in, ter in terms of pleasing them. Sure, sure, at the time... Uh, they were getting older, and you would start off with Matthew yeah. Looney, maybe you thought, huh, I better concentrate on this Maria character. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Uh, I think uh, I have an observation. Um, one, one of the great devices I like that uh, you use in your books is uh, turning conventions upside down. Like uh, in Voyage to the Earth, you begin right away on page one by citing three very real uh, scientific books written by earthlings about the moon the passages describe the moon as a unpleasant cold dead place and then you quote from a book written by a moonster describing the earth in about the same terms a lifeless rock that irony pretty much sets the tone for the yeah. whole series well those are one of those is a real book i think i can't remember uh-huh no who, who said the moon is a, a lifeless dead place that's um, it, they, they kind of that's like a summary or my my summation of, of all those yeah. quotes of, of the three quotes and then, and then you uh, just you know turn it upside down and say that the the moonsters believe pretty much the same thing about the earth that's right yeah yeah it's uh, well, that's that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that appeals to me right. and uh, I think I think I when I was writing about Maria Looney, there were three Maria Looney books, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I tried to make her a sympathetic, smart girl, you know. Right. Smarter than her brother, Matthew. 
Yeah, she kind of reminds me, like nowadays, uh, of a Lisa Simpson character, in a way, from uh, The Simpsons. I don't know if you've ever seen uh -huh. that cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, almost like she was some kind of prototype. <laughs> uh huh. Um, yeah, I, it's primarily this uh, humorous you're using that, that device, but uh, I think it's kind of sociologically revealing uh, and scary if we looked at it seriously because people on the moon are, are just like us and they, you know, in your books they have the same human foibles. They're yeah. made up of individuals with divergent views. Uh, you, you've got these political factions who are at odds over what to do with the Earth. You know, the scientists want to be careful and explore it, but the anti-Earthers uh, headed by uh, Robin K. Caruso, <laughs> another pun, want it destroyed. Immediately they think it's ugly and useless. Uh, did you hear, I guess, a lot of that kind of talk directed at the moon in the late 50s and early 60s? I mean, not that we wanted to destroy it, but in the early days of the U.S. space program, did you? No, uh, I don't remember that. Hear, hear uh, stuff like the space program is a waste of money or why would we want to go to the moon, that kind of thing? Uh, I don't think so. Hmm. Okay. I do remember some twist that appealed to me was when uh, Matthew Looney was considering going to the Earth, I think. One of the things he was going to try to figure out was why the tides rose and fell. Mm -hmm. In other words, he didn't have any... I thought that was a cute trick. Oh, right, yeah, I remember. For him on the moon to have to try to find out why the tides moved as they do. Mm -hmm. So when he when he landed, he ended up in Florida, I think, didn't he? That's right. Yeah, Cape Canaveral. That's in the second book. Uh, well, in the first book, he ends up in the Antarctic because they thought those conditions were most like the moon. They were cold, and their life as moon kind might know it might be there, uh -huh. if anywhere on Earth. But then the second book, they go to Cape Canaveral, where the rockets were coming from. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the books. Uh were pretty, pretty good sellers at the time, but they, the publisher who published them uh, merged with another publisher, and it kind of, they weren't, they didn't sell as well no. in those later years. The W.R. Sky? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. That's how I got started writing the Looney books. Uh, the editor, Scott, was a friend of mine, and she suggested that I, that I write, try some children's books. Mm -hmm. And so I was one step, I had one step in the right direction when she suggested that, because she, she, when she did see an outline of what I was going to do, she felt that it was, part of it was her idea, too. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a new market for you at the time, right? Uh, you, you hadn't written any children's books up to that time. I don't, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. the, the book that I've had most success with was not about Matthew Looney or the Oh, sure. I think the Clambake Mutiny it was called. Okay. Oh, I sent you a list of my books. Yeah, yeah. I have that. I'm going to put that on the Internet as well. Uh, yeah, you know, let's see. I have a bunch of notes here I'm, I'm looking for. Uh, your father was a big writer, too, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Because uh, I, I know I found that uh, he wrote a mystery book that he's well known for, The 24th Hour. Is that him? The 24th Hour? Yeah, have you heard of that 1930 the book? The 24th Hour was a short story. Okay. Fiction that he wrote. And uh, in those days, they had a prize called the O. Henry Prize mm -hmm. Contest, and he, he won, won it one year for that story. Right. But he, he wrote fiction for magazines, mostly. Okay. Saturday Evening Post. Right. I know he wrote Will Rogers, a Will Rogers book in 1935. Well, you've done a pretty good job of researching <laughs> it, <I must laughs> <say. laughs> I've just been looking around. <laughs> uh... Yeah, well, you know, when 
part of the reason it, it's accidental on my part is when I'd be looking up stuff, I'd look it up under Jerome uh, Beatty without the junior on it, and then I would get his stuff too. Then I'd have to sort through and who, you know, as to who wrote what. Well, that's uh, it, it's confusing because I'm not really a junior, and so I've, uh -huh. a, a lot of things I wrote. They left the junior off. Oh, right. And uh, it made my father rather upset when that happened because he, he thought he had established his own name. Right. But actually it was his fault for naming me Jerome in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you're talking a lot like your Saturday review. You often come up without the junior, I think. You got the Saturday Review in your... Well, I, I've read uh, quotes from it on certain web pages. And I'll have to send you those links, too, so you can look and see what's out there. You've done a pretty good job. <laughs> um, yeah, I wrote, like for, I, I wrote the, uh, for the Saturday Review for about 10 or 12 years, uh -huh. every, every other month. Yeah. Uh, and I found something that you wrote in a Smithsonian magazine back in April of uh, 1995. You, you have a little... Uh, I don't think so. You, you, well, it's quoted to your name. Maybe it's a different Jerome Beatty, but you say... Uh, let's see if this is you. I theorize there are so many admonitory signs posted around the country that no one pays attention to them. The only 100% effective sign I've ever seen is on the Arkansas interstate. Hitchhikers oh, yeah. may be escaped convicts. Do you uh, remember that? Yes. Oh. I think it's. I think that's a letter to the editor. Right. Right. Yeah. It. I think it is. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it popped up in my search. <laughs> well, I don't understand, Ken, how you find these remote uh, references. Well, I, I just uh, search under your name and uh, using these search engines on the internet and. There are pages up there that uh, have, you know, uh, excerpts from the Saturday Review, Smithsonian Magazine, up but, there. That's on the Smithsonian webpage. Yeah, so you print them out, do you? And yeah, and I print them out, yeah. 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 Um, are you an advisor uh, for 19th century studies at the Franklin and Marshall College? No, that must be another one. Okay, because I have found your name associated with the advisory board, and I didn't know if that maybe was your father or... No, there are a couple of Jerome Beatty's oh, sure. around the world, and uh, they, they, I, they often get listed as authors having written the Matthew Looney books, for example. Oh, right. Sometimes right. they get them, get them mixed up. Yeah. Well, well I was just curious, because I had come across this website that had, had that name there. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? I was going to ask you... Um, well, about uh, one of the major themes of your first book and second book, and, you know, if you can, you know, have major themes for a kid's book, I suppose you can, is that uh, you, you say that kind of that knowledge is its own reward, uh, or, or more precisely, I forget what page it's on, you say something to the effect that um, one never knows where a piece of information is going to come in handy, such as, like you were discussing with the tides on the water on Earth. Uh, so essentially, uh, uh, children or anyone should learn as much as possible. In Voyage uh, to the Earth, Matthew Looney saves the fate of the moon's space program by having made observations while exploring Earth and recording his data. Then later, that data becomes the evidence he needs to convince the Space Navy's Court of Inquiry that uh, Captain Lockhart Lucky Looney's mission to the Earth was not wasteful, you remember. No, that, that sounds very serious. <laughs> yeah, I know the way that uh, even even though they did not find life on Earth, they they learned more about it. And, uh, what, what book is that from? Um, that's that's really from the first book. Really? Yeah, the, the first book you end with one of those uh, dramatic court scenes where Lockhart Looney is uh, being tried for uh, having kind of been neglectful on his voyage and. Uh, I guess I kind of put down Lockhart Lindley in that. He's made out to be sort of a dumbbell, isn't he? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Matthew's the smart one <laughs> who, who makes these observations and saves the day by having uh, recorded this data. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very good. You're, you're, those, those books are really good. In fact, you know, I was, uh, oh, did I, I was reading a, a site 
by, and I just emailed this guy, uh, one of the band members, I think, of, I think it's Erasure. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of big band, and uh, you influenced one of those guys. They read your, your series when they were a kid. So I sent them a link to, our, to, the, to the site. Um, let's see, you were in the military. You were in the Army. Uh, and I think that comes through pretty good because uh, you seem to have emulated the bureaucratic arrogance well. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, some of the services. Um, Did you find in your research magazine articles and stories that I'd written? Did I? Well, I mean, I've written, I, I wrote a lot of... What about... So let's say I wrote... Uh, an article for a magazine Did that appear in your uh, oh not always no a, not everything's up there yet yeah uh, in the future it probably will be <laughs> I don't know um, well you know a lot of things can only be used in small quotes or uh, directly from the copyright holders you know under under fair use doctrine uh, but, you know, not everything, like, everything you've written is not going to be on the uh, Internet because it, it's still copyrighted by whoever, you know. Well, presumably, uh, the, I, think the, I think the copyright law now is, protects the work for 50 years after the death of the author, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, so, I know it kept changing. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so so your stuff because uh, like the publisher just had first publication rights usually, and it reverts back to the author. So your stuff's not going to be all be up there, and you won't find it. More than likely, I mean, you might find it on some rogue website. <laughs> uh, I I didn't find anything any like long articles you'd written from the Saturday Review up there. Well, in your in your email, you told me a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. And I in the Air Force? Huh? In the Air Force? Yeah, yeah the Air Force mm -hmm. and the jobs you have, the computer jobs you work. That's right. And I couldn't figure out how you had time to do all that. Oh well, that that's why I, I you know I'm I'm being subsidized by the corporations to <laughs> research my personal projects. <laughs> <laughs> Monsanto? Yeah, Monsanto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're a big company. They can afford it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let's see, I have a few questions here. Uh, did, did you think that uh, these, these children's books were going to be as successful as they were? Did, do you have any idea you'd be writing six sequels after that first one? No. No, it's not till after the first one's published and gets a good hearing that, that you think, gee, I ought to go and do another one of these. Right. And you have to... I mean, I always had to have a, a market available to me. I couldn't... I still can't just write something for the heck of it. Mm-hmm. So you have to... Uh, yeah, a children's book, you would have to work up an outline of some sort. Oh, right. Right. Convince the publisher mm -hmm. to give you a contract before you spend a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. I have a few manuscripts from sitting around here now that got rejected by publishers. Oh yeah. What, what are you thinking about? Uh, maybe resubmitting them to someone, or do you think they're they, outdated? They seem a little out of date now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Huh. How'd you uh, team up with the illustrator of those books, uh, Gahan Wilson? Yeah, well. There was a magazine called Colliers, uh -huh. and I was for for a couple of years. I was the cartoon editor, and I used to pick cartoons. And Gay and Wilson uh, drew cartoons that were published in Colliers, and I was the editor. Oh, okay. So when the time came to get an illustrator, we asked Gay and if he would if he was interested. And he said yes. Oh, that's great. Since then, he's become a great success. And yeah. He's in the New Yorker frequently. Uh, right, and uh, Playboy, he does uh, articles too, or uh, the little one-panel yeah. Charles Adams-type cartoons. 
I think he's one of the greatest. He's really terrific. Yeah. But he's so successful now, he doesn't even, uh, he would never consider illustrating a book of mine. I think. <laughs> yeah. But I've got an autographed picture of him somewhere, and I remember, I remember when he was just a, he's from Chicago, incidentally. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so he's up around me here. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and now that he's a, he's a big shot, you know, if anyone in the future was ever going to make a cartoon series of your Matthew Looney books, they couldn't use his designs. <laughs> they had to pay him all kinds of money. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. You were born in, uh, was it 1918 or 1916? Uh, 16. 16, okay. Yeah. All right. I, I, there was a, I saw a conflicting... Well, I went, uh, I went to... Uh, Attracted two years from my birthday. I wanted to seem younger than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think that comes from uh, the contemporary authors. Right, right, right. Th th they misprinted, or didn't. No, they? I, I, when I f filled out the form, they sent me. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd cheat a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. You're the only person that's ever questioned me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the only one paying attention on the planet. <laughs> Um, let's see, I noticed uh, know-it-alls seem to be a ripe target for satire in your kids' books. Is, is this because you're ad advancing your theme of uh, free thinking and inquiry versus uh, ignorance? <laughs> um, I suppose so. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I hope that affects the election on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, I'd like to have a free thinking President, wouldn't you? Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who are you going to vote for, bad candidate number one or bad candidate number two? <laughs> um, let's see. You have a lot of puns. So you love puns, don't you? Yeah. In your books. Uh, it's, it's, in fact, in, in your fourth book, uh, The Space Pirates, you have an uh, entire planet full of punsters. If you recall, ruled by the great Kalonkis. But uh, your puns are, I, I kind of like how you uh, continually through your series uh, maintain the puns uh, using the word moon it instead of minute. You know, mooniversity instead of university. Oh, yes. Moonkind instead of mankind, that kind of thing. It's pretty funny. Well, that stuff's easy to think of. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure, it's uh, pretty entertaining, though. Well, <laughs> All the same. See, what happened was after these books came out, we landed on the moon and it turned out Nobody was there. Nobody lived there. Right. Oh, sure. I mean, there was no strange creatures living in the caves. So, mm -hmm. so I think I think I had to start going to out of outer space, didn't I? One of the books. Yeah. Uh huh. We started going to outer space, and then I think towards the end, when you got to uh, your uh, uh, fifth book, or well, excuse me, no, your your sixth book, Marie Looney and the Cosmic uh, Circus, then things. You, you kind of didn't even bother trying to maintain. You just went into the fantasy realm of the moon and you gave the moon forests and jungles and stuff and just did your own thing. So, because probably by then you realized, oh, well, we're, we're so far off from the truth here, it doesn't really matter the kids' books. So you yeah. used it as your story. Well, didn't, was one of them about, took place on a planet called Palancas? Um, yeah, that was uh, the space pirate. You, you got off into space. And they, they landed on that planet. Yeah, Belunkus. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, actually, that, that brings me up to, uh, see, they were headed to a place called Free Holy. Free Holy. On that one, yeah, which, which brings me up to uh, um, one of the things I like about your, your novels is uh, the different levels you wrote on. I mean, there, there's the straight kid story, but there's uh, something that adults would understand even better as they're reading it. Uh, you know, kids might think it's just colorful background. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have these socio-political parodies in the, in the puns. Uh, and some of the puns aren't so blatantly obvious to uh, even adult readers. Uh, well, I mean, some are, but like, for example, uh, in Matthew Looney in the Outback, you have a caravan of monsters heading out to colonize the planets around a recently explored star system. The star system's named Free Holy which uh, at first seems rather cryptic, 
uh, you have 12 planets orbiting free holy and only two are sufficiently habitable for life as moonkind knows it anyway and those planets you named tamale and enchilada which uh just by itself would seem to be absurdist humor but uh it's magnified for of course anyone who's aware that the spanish word for beans is frijole <laughs> spelled you know f-r-i-j-o-l-e yeah yeah <laughs> uh, I saw that. pretty clever I think. <laughs> yeah yeah, it, you know, it's funny, too, because I've seen people spell the Spanish word in the English way you do for that star system. Oh, yeah. 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 You, uh, what, what made you think of that? Just something funny to do? Or? I don't know. <laughs> Just something you'd stick in there, a strange detail. <laughs> well, it worked. It was enjoyable. Uh, we were talking about free thinking earlier. Uh, one of the things I like about your books is, um, well, I mentioned you kind of have a, a, a well a crusade maybe against conventional thinking because right. uh, uh, conventional thinking isn't really thinking at all in the in the loony verse things uh, like in real life don't uh, aren't what they appear to be earth has life after all even though every moonster with common sense has learned that water is a harmful chemical and that oxygen is deadly <laughs> So when Matt sees uh, evidence directly in opposition with this commonly held notion, of course he, he balks at first, but he accepts it, it's the newfound truth. It, it seems to me you've made the observation that uh, even we Earthers often think in stereotypes and old patterns rather than, you know, remaining open-minded and observant. Uh, people are quick to judge anything outside the norm. and. Uh, the Earth people in your second book are, are pretty quick to assert their superiority over the Moonsters before they know anything about them. Uh, Earthlings have been walking around with their heads held up high thinking, you know, they're God's special creatures or, or scientifically more recently that they're just the top of the evolutionary ladder. Would you say the human instinct seems to be to demonize or dehumanize anything or anyone that's too different from ourselves? Probably. <laughs> I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm, I'm using an adult frame of mind to to look in, you know, to, to look too closely or seriously at the, the books. But it's just it's uh, interesting that your your characters, your your civilization, how it's set up to mirror ours in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um. see well for, for myself let's see I've, I've got a question about uh, Hector Hornblower you kind of have this malicious character in, in your book do uh, you remember creating him and uh, is he based on anyone you know or Hornblower yeah yeah my uh, in-laws were named Hornblower Oh, are they really? <laughs> my wife's my wife's um, stepmother was named Hornblower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole family was named Hornblower. That's right. <laughs> oh, did they appreciate the <laughs> use of the name? I don't know what their reaction was. <laughs> they even <laughs> they even look at the books, <laughs> read them. Uh. Uh, he, he, what happened to him, he, Hector Hornblower? What happened to him? Yeah, did he fly off in space or something? Oh, I can't. I think the last time you see him, he's uh, imprisoned in the space pirates on the planet of Belong. Oh yeah. I think that's where he got left for his uh, treachery against the moon. Uh, he got off easy, though, <laughs> for what he was doing. Uh, are you, here, here's a question. I, I myself am, uh, am an atheist, but I, I don't pretend religious people might, might have a brain as open as mine. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I, I've cut down my picking in the Sunday school so alternate weekends. And I'm just joking with that. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, are you religious at all, or... Am I what? Are you religious at all? Religious I, I don't really think so. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I, well, I only asked about religion because I noticed that uh, you go out of your way to have Matthew Looney forgive Hector Hornblower's malicious behavior at the end of the story. So I was curious if you thought then maybe that uh, I don't think forgiveness. Uh, or... No, don't don't read too much into that. Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that was nice of him to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I guess I'm not a very religious person. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't, I don't try to inject the, it into my books anyway. Sure, sure. Any sort of philo- religion and philosophy. Yeah. Well, they're very entertaining books. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed is that uh, your books today, I think, would raise a lot of uh, red flags in some ways. Uh, on the politically correct topics in uh and you know maybe i'm reading something into this but uh like in matthew looney and the outback which nowadays is probably one of my favorite series in that book reading as an adult 